Mesoamerican Landscape Accelerator. But I just first want to introduce uh, the key partners who will be part of this. And uh, allow me to introduce Solidaridad and our work on landscapes. Solidaridad is a global network. Uh, we work in uh, over six continents. Uh, the cases that will be presented here will be mainly from the Mesoamerican area. But uh, Solidaridad with the landscape approach, we work in all the continents that we work in. And just to say that uh, uh, our call to action for the landscapes, uh, although we started off with more interest in the commodity sectors and the supply chains, but we've seen the necessity of harvesting both the natural and the social capital that the landscapes offer. And so as Solidaridad, we mainly work to bring the different actors together using our multi-stakeholder platforms. So we work to bring together the partners and key partners that today maybe will be addressing their needs is the public and private sector investors. And this session will be trying to bring out aspects on how do we unlock finance from both the public and private sector? What are the risks that both the investors might fear in investing in landscapes? Why should an investor be interested in a landscape? But we also want to see on how do we make communities to be investment ready so that when we are working together with investors, we are not able, we mitigate a lot of risks that are associated with the uh, putting the finance in such landscapes. Um, to start off with the discussions, uh, I have a number of uh, speakers today, and uh, my name is Nancy Rapando from Solidaridad East Africa, uh, and I'll be your moderator for the day. I'm the landscape and climate specialist. I would also want to call upon the rest of the uh, speakers. Oh, they need to, okay, fine, then I'll introduce you, just stand up and just say hi. Uh, allow me to introduce Carlos Perez, who is our landscape and climate specialist at Solidaridad. Uh, Flavio Linaeus has been actively in this room, presenting a lot. He's the technical head of programs, Solidaridad Mesoamerica. Flavio. Uh, Michael Metz, who's the coordinator international projects on forest restoration, or OVAD. And then we have Duncan Gromko from Unique. Is Duncan here? Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to start our session with uh, Flavio. Flavio, we would like you to talk about maybe the landscape aspirations of Solidaridad and uh, introduce the Mesoamerican landscape and what you guys are doing there. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I will introduce uh, briefly uh, what uh, Solidia is a uh, step to working on the landscape uh, approach. As you know, Solidia is a uh, networking uh, institutions uh, around the, the global. We are working with uh, 13 uh, um, commodities. But uh, talking about uh, Honduras, for example, especially we are uh, our experiences uh, to share with you about the landscape uh, management uh, project program. Uh, we call the title is uh, Pasos in Espanol, which is uh, Paisajes Sostenibles in Honduras. That, uh, we, we create this kind of uh, title that can be uh, embraced with the several stakeholders in Honduras. That means Solidaridad was working in Mesoamerica with coffee, cocoa, palm oil, sugar, and livestock. Uh, there is other initiative regarding to vegetables and fruits. But uh, that is the symbol that you know identify there, and you can to, 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 to go to the, to the Internet and to explore more about these kind of commodities in our region. In innovation area, we are working at, in, in the landscapes and climate change, uh, impact investments, gender and social inclusion, and digital technology using different apps for different commodities, and now we are exploring other apps regarding to the landscape performance. Next, please. Yeah. So um, the reason that we uh, decided to go to the landscape uh, 
approach or perspective was that, uh, as you know, that uh, we are working with palm oil in Honduras, which is uh, the main driver in the littoral del norte in Honduras. That means uh, this kind of palm oil uh, commodities uh, is, is spread out in this kind of three valleys in, in the north of, of Honduras. Uh, that means a lot of impacts, social, economic, and uh, environmental impacts. And uh, as you know, palm oil is an interesting, interesting commodity for, for the economy in Honduras, especially for the smallholders. I think in Honduras, the, is, is the commodity regarding more the social sector in Honduras. It's a difference to the other countries, especially in Guatemala or, or, or Colombia, in, in, etc. So uh, we decided that uh, to, our purpose is to reverse degradation and negative impacts from agricultural production, not just for, for palm oil, but regarding to banana, uh, sugar, and other, uh, other crops in that uh, landscape. Next, please. So due to we have at the beginning a um, uh, multi-stakeholder platform regarding to the palm oil, uh, that was the, the, the environment uh, to create confidence and to talk about what's going on at the landscape perspective. That means we decided to, at the beginning, to have an interview from the all key actors in the landscape, municipalities, social NGO, uh, local groups, communities, what's going on about the different issues regarding to the landscape. That means uh, then we go into the next step to have uh, to invite the stakeholders to have a spe spe specific sessions in, in each body. These are three main bodies, the session and how to to get from them priorities. For example, this is the the results from you are so you are using this uh, um, uh, you, uh, tool. And you can see that the, the, the remarks, uh, words in that is, is the, the awareness of the concern from the audience, you know. It's territorial, it's uh, important to planning and different education and different, a lot of people express different concerns about the landscape. That means we decide to prioritize concerns and to organize who is the most important issue that the people is demanding to look for solutions and that could create uh, this kind of communication uh, to rethink planning for investments and, this, and think how to create relationships within different actors. Uh, in some cases, believe it or not, people, people it was well, well, the first time that the people sit down together to discuss what's going on about the landscape issues. Next. So that is the reason that we uh, invited uh, and the PBL was our main partners to, to provide a support in terms of modeling the landscape because we have a lot of uh, people involved. Uh, we need, uh, how to say, to refresh ideas how to distillery a lot of indicators, a lot of concern from the landscape. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Flavio. <clears throat> For that introduction, uh, at this uh, at this moment, um, I would like to uh, to call Johan from PBL. He's uh, one of our strong partners in the selection and modeling of the landscape that we have selected in Northern Honduras. I know that Johan gave a presentation earlier <laughs> this morning, so we do, I want to be fair with you. Just you know, maybe it takes two or three minutes to to give a quick summary on the, how you did the modeling and the difficulties, you know, the challenges getting the data, et cetera, and then something about the, the, uh, the results of the modeling. Thank you, Johan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Johan Meyer. I work at the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And uh, on behalf of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, we look uh, into options on how organizations can use, for instance, landscape approaches or apply integrated landscape management. And we had the very lucky opportunity to collaborate with Solidaridad to apply uh, our spatial modeling and scenario work in the North Coast uh, landscape. Um, for this, we gathered a lot of data, spatial data, statistics, to build, for instance, a more like business-as-usual scenario 
uh, based on historical trends and ambitions of, for instance, the government on doubling palm oil uh, production by the year 2030, um, but also ideas on food security, water management, ecotourism, all sort of ambitions that the stakeholders in this PASOS uh, program are, yeah, they, they want to achieve this. And we try to implement, to look at uh, these ambitions uh, through the framework of the sustainable development goals. So saying we not focus only on food security or water management, but look at it, at it more in an integrated way. Um, so we went to Honduras, uh, spoke with many of the stakeholders involved, gathered a lot of data, made inventories of how these ambitions could be realized within this landscape, and also tried to find synergies between these different ambitions. So sort of doing the right thing in the right place. Maybe that's a typical Dutch thing because we have a small country with a lot of people. You want to do it as efficient as possible. But let's see how that works in Honduras. Um, so we analyzed land use change for different scenarios. Um, and then we came up with this summary figure saying, okay, how do these scenarios end up for the number of SDGs that we were able to analyze? So we looked at food in the sense of food provisioning, the area uh, where food is produced in a sort of sustainable way, saying, of course, if the stakeholders don't want to allow like intensive pineapple production in riparian zones, then it's sort of not contributing to that, achieving that ambition. Um, what is happening with the agriculture export production uh, on water, let's say water availability, we looked at water purification, ecosystem services for nitrogen and phosphate, uh, erosion control. We looked at climate for carbon storage, let's say more or less the extent of the forest area, but also the mosaics used for agroforestry practices. And also on biodiversity, so uh, how does it change? How is natural land cover? in protected areas being respected and how are potential biocorridors being used or uh, supported. So in that sense, this figure, this sort of current situation, and if it's to the right, it is getting worse. And if it's to the left, it's actually improving. So uh, you can already see that for a business as usual scenario or a scenario that we defined also with the stakeholders in the PASOS program that looks more at accelerating the uh, expansion of export crops like palm oil and pineapple and sugarcane. Um, you will produce some more food because there's just 30% more people also um, doing agriculture, but it goes at the cost of a lot of water quality, quantity, erosion, your forest area, your biodiversity, everything is sort of um, a, a large trade-off, let's say. And um, when we try to model it in a more, let's say, integrated way, where we apply the number of the uh, spatial rules that we got from the stakeholders by doing the right thing in the right place, um, we got to improving, or at least status quo, a number of these indicators, but some of them fairly well others slightly, but also several, you know, barely sort of limiting the loss that you occur in a business as usual scenario, but still very challenging. So maybe even the ambitions that are below such a scenario on investments that you have to make, uh, yeah, you might have to consider or discuss them with stakeholders and government to see uh, how you even can improve that. So is that a good? Thank you very much, Johan. So uh, we kept uh, the work uh, going and uh, trying to have um, as many uh, stakeholders together to figure out where to invest, how to design uh, an investment plan that would uh, take care of the low-hanging fruits and also some of the conclusions that we, that we obtain from the landscape modeling. So the, the, all the problems that are going on in the, and problems and opportunities, of course, in the landscape, uh, we can summarize in deforestation, 
soil loss, uh, water and food uh, security is also a, a major problem. Pollution of water sources, if you, you were talking late, uh, earlier about uh, social issues in northern Honduras, we just uh, had a, in a zone in the Tocoa region, there is a mining that going on, there are mining concession that is going to pollute water, so the, the people there uprise to, to stop it. A methane release, especially from all these uh, uh, palm oil uh, mills and effluents. Reef destruction, that's on the coastal side. And the climate change, from the <coughs> sorry, mitigation and adaptation. And of course, immigration. That's something that is uh, currently in the news for Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Uh, also, uh, in this uh, landscape, there is also great opportunities for uh, conservation. Uh, I already talked about the, the reefs, coral reefs. is the second most important coral reefs in the world. We have Australia and then the Caribbean, Honduras, Belize, and these areas. Also, 30 to 40 percent of the, of the landscape is still in the forest, natural forest, and of course, of course, uh, mangroves is still, is still there. So, uh, talking about low-hanging fruits, uh, what can we invest that will take care of, you know, all these uh, erosion control issues, water pollution, and also the landscape restoration uh, in, in, in this area, in the northern area of Honduras. So we, we have decided with the uh, local stakeholders to go for palm-based renewable energy, cocoa agroforestry, and also uh, fruits, and this is uh, rambutan. So all these have great opportunities in the landscape. So a quick summary of the of the investments uh, for the we have sustainable cocoa agroforestry. This is in the production side, and is um, to install something like uh, 2,000 hectares of agroforestry cocoa. Then we have um, another project for cocoa already there, uh, which is now missing some uh, quality improvement for the, for the product. And the investment then has to do about cocoa processing and quality facility. And this is also, uh, this will help uh, somewhat like 1,000 small scale farmers that are together in a cooperative to improve the cocoa quality for the markets. And the other, last but not least, is a renewable energy program uh, based on uh, palm oil waste. There in the picture you have the effluence from mills, but also we are considering biomass because uh, there are two opportunities that all together uh, represent um, an investment of about $48 million for uh, electricity plants based on palm oil residues. So the sustainable cocoa agroforestry, this is the cocoa production and processing. Okay, we have a, a very brief description. I will not describe each, all the detail about the investment because, uh, of course, this is, is a lot bigger than this. But we, well, the way we are approaching is, okay, we will invest in these facilities, but then what are the innovations that are bringing in, that we are bringing in? 
and also how this will impact at the social, economic, and of course at the landscape level. So in innovations, uh, here we have like, for instance, bringing digital technology, you know, give, bringing technical assistance to 1,000 farmers is not that easy in a very, uh, I would say, economic matter, uh, economic manner. So uh, in Solidaridad, we have um, these capacities and also uh, we will bring uh, capacity building to operate all these uh, digital systems to provide technical assistance and improve productivity, for instance. And of course, the, the COCOA itself will bring landscape restoration because it will be set in, uh, in areas that now are not forestry, okay, are mostly pasture land, but uh, good land for COCOA production. So at the impact over the 10 years, we hope to have increased revenues, increased revenues from uh, the managed cocoa agroforestry improvement, improve yields and quality, and better market strategies for, for the products, and hopefully carbon credits. We know that uh, cocoa agroforestry, if placed in areas that were deforested, at least 10 years ago or more, we could, uh, it, it can go, we, it has room for some of the standards that uh, could bring in uh, the credit, crediting uh, opportunities for carbon credits. Of course, in the social, in the social side, uh, we hope to increase income and employment, of course, improve food security, and the creation of a social fund for small-scale farmers. This is also, uh, has also been discussed with the cooperative and they agreed to it. And at the landscape level, uh, we hope to have more than 2,000 hectares on the sustainable land management, etc., with the better coverage and with an opportunity of 30,000 more hectares that could be uh, implemented under agroforestry systems. Of course, uh, now we are providing a summary of the investment needs, uh, the, the payback of the investment, the percent interest that we have already been discussing with some of the impact investors, and then uh, two years grace. So these are minimum indicators of what the impact investors need to know. Of course, as I said, behind all this, there is a, a, a bigger rationale that uh, we can then uh, take on with the impact investors to talk about. So the other, uh, the other investment is for these cocoa processing facilities for better quality is uh, pretty much it's very much like the, like the other investment to improve what we already have in terms of agroforestry management, better, better yields, et cetera, and better quality. And this will bring similar impacts like the one I already uh, described in, uh, before. So the, the other um, investment that we are already uh, taking on and talking to investors is the setting up of a facility that will generate some, something like uh, 48 megawatts of power. And this will uh, take the opportunity that we have with all the biomass from residues, from palm oil, and potentially other residues around the, the industries and uh, generate power, also the, the effluence. So we, we can take on all the biogas and, uh, and uh, capture it and then convert it into energy. Of course, here we, this, this is going to give us also the opportunity to uh, take on carbon credits, okay?
the other, uh, uh, I, I have been talking about Honduras, but we can take the potential that we have for a programmatic approach because we have palm oil uh, uh, in uh, Guatemala, in Mexico, we have uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, we are not working in Costa Rica, but in Costa Rica also there is opportunity, Colombia, etc. So with this programmatic approach, uh, we could build more uh, onto s other uh, investment to generate power from palm residues. Uh, in Honduras, in northern Honduras, there is uh, 1.3 million hectares that are uh, considered like Kyoto land. Kyoto land, if you remember, although we are now into the Kyoto discussion, <laughs> but Kyoto land is that land that was deforested on uh, December uh, 31 from 1989 or earlier. So it has been deforested for about, what, 30 years or more. So we have also a good potential in, in northern Honduras for um, uh, 1.3 million hectares for forestry, but also in Guatemala and Nicaragua, and altogether is about 3 million hectares of uh, Kyoto land. Of course, uh, a Solidaridad role in these uh, investments, we are a neutral convener and facilitator and have the uh, facilitated discussion between uh, the investors and the local uh, stakeholders that will take on the, the investment. Of course, the deal sourcing, the preparation of all this investment, the costs, uh, revenues, uh, and the the IRR, all the, these indicators that are needed for the investors. And then also we hope to be providing or to be there to for the post-investment services to so that we can take on the together with the investors and the local stakeholders and keep on, uh, you know, like with these digital technologies, build, building capacities and learning and dissemination for other countries. So I have a red card. <laughs> okay, the key partners is, uh, well, multilateral banks, international NGOs, ministries. We have PBL here. Thank you, Johan, again. Farmers associations, Prospero. Where is David? David is not here yet. Ministries, etc. And thank you very much. I think uh, I am at the end of the presentation and here are also some of the our uh, colleagues that uh, well in the presentations uh, if you can have it uh, later but you have the um, emails address that you uh, for you to uh, contact later thank you very much okay thank you so much Carlos for the Quite an elaborate presentation, but I think uh, it makes a lot of sense that we are able to look at what works, the examples down on the landscape, taking the landscape, thinking down on the ground and looking at how we can prioritize different investments, the modeling work that was presented by PBL in terms of prioritization, the key innovations that can be in the landscape. Uh, I, think, I think that really makes sense on making things real. But um, I still have to ensure that uh, we get to understand this further, maybe just to have some questions on how this can be done. And I'll be posing questions to part of our panels, panel members. Um, my first question goes to Mikkel. Mikkel, what, are, what do you see as specific barriers? You can take the seat. Um, you guys decided that you're not taking the seats, but you can still take in case you have enough chairs. Oh, you can sit behind, beside me then. 
uh, Flavio has decided to turn into a photographer. It's fine. <laughs> but then let me ask Mikkel the first question. Mikkel, what do you think are the specific barriers to for public and private investors investing into such in such landscape models? Well, from from our experience and perspective. Okay. Well, from from our experience um, and perspective, um, the, the 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 major problem for to, to get investment from the private sector and also public funding is that um, uh, investable projects um, are lacking. Um, and this is um, something where I see that uh, you're already working on to, to, to fill this, this gap, to bridge this gap. And um, uh, the other thing is um, the, 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 the investment, the, the risk of the investment is often um, a barrier for uh, um, investors because um, these projects um, in these countries and land use projects um, bear often um, a lot of risks. Um, the, the scale of the project is often an issue because um, investors are looking for large scale projects and um, we're working um, mostly with local communities and in, in, in small scale um, projects and um, this is also uh, this is always a problem to, 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 to get the financing because investors are looking for um, for larger vol volumes um, of investment um, also the long-term nature of these projects um, is a barrier um, because um, the investments desire usually is um, the, uh, to, to have a, a liquidity um, of their financial um, resources and um, it takes a lot of time until you can create the first revenues from land use projects. Um, as I see, you, already, you also um, are calculating um, to, with the first paybacks after seven to eight years. Um, and um, It's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is a long time, but um, um, other um, other barriers for um, private sector investment is um, um, the lack of local um, capacities that that you need um, to, to to create the capacities on the local level, especially when you're working together with local communities. Um, for example, we're working together with local communities um, in the buffer zone of um, protected area in Guatemala. And um, these, uh, there's a high rate of illiteracy. So um, if you, so you need to create a lot of capacity and to create um, business skills so that you can, um, uh, to can create these, these, these business cases on local level. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mikel, for the, for such. Uh, you've mentioned a number of uh, a number of barriers, including the scale of projects, uh, the time that uh, we we thinking in terms of getting things around, issues of illiteracy uh, and everything. But now I I want to pose my question to uh, our colleague, that is Duncan Gromko. Uh, Duncan, based on these uh, based on these barriers, what services do you think? Uh, what services do investors need on the ground so that these these barriers can be overcome? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so first, maybe just to explain a little bit where I'm coming from, so you can have some perspective of where, what the things I say. So. Um, right now, I work for Unique Forestry and Land Use. It's a German consulting company. And basically, um, one thing that I'm working on is an investment accelerator where I'm trying to match um, impact investors to projects that are quite similar to this. Um, and so with this background, you know, I, I, I think I can understand, you know, if I came to some of our contacts, what they might say about this. Um, uh, I want to, yeah. I think that the the first question I would have if I was an, an investor looking at this project is um, like who is who is my my um, my borrower who is the partner that I'm in, investing in um, and maybe you have it and you just didn't present it but um, 
you know, I, I'll never forget one. And one of my first experiences was I found this really cool project, and I developed a really nice cost-benefit analysis and cash flow analysis. And then I took this to an investor, and they said, "Well, so they, you know, they looked at the spreadsheet, and he looked at it for a minute, and I said, "Well, so what? So who's the business? Like, what was their revenue last year?" And I didn't know. You know, um, so I think we need to think about like investors don't think in terms of project mostly don't think in terms of project financing. They think in terms of corporate financing. So who is the the institution that I'm investing in, and what is their current capacity? What are their revenues? Um, who is their management? What have they done before that is similar enough to this? Um, so I think that um, an investor to look into this needs to identify a really credible counterpart that they're going to put their money into. Um, and I, I happen to actually know, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know specifically this case, but um, I, in a previous job, I, I, we developed a credit line for uh, Bancafe, uh, a, a financial institution in Honduras that primarily lends to coffee producers, but we help them to develop a, a cocoa credit line. So actually, I, I wonder um, if maybe they're interested in this. I don't know. Um, but, in, but in general, to answer the question, what I think you need is to help an investor to identify a credible counterparty who's going to take on the money and that if that counterparty um, is far away from meeting the investor's kind of um, criteria or that they have, you know, it could be financial management or um, and, uh, what is their, their credit risk uh, pr process, that you, that we, you have to help the investor to build up their counterparty um, if the counterparty is, is not strong enough. Um, yeah, I'll stop there, but maybe I have a chance to talk some more later. Okay, uh, quite good insights on how we can overcome these barriers. But I, I just want to take this question to Flavio, that the barriers and uh, how we can unlock the barriers. But there's also the issue of the communities on the landscape being investment ready. We're looking at the different investments that Carlos mentions. Do you think the communities are ready for these investments, or what do you think needs to be done to make communities to be ready, to be ready for the investments? Uh, yes, uh, following the, the last speaker, I think it's very important to create uh, capacities in the farmers' associations, especially in the, in the business. That means uh, they, they, they are well producers, but uh, they are willing to accept the challenge to increase productivity, to increase quality. But uh, business, as you know, uh, business is the key issues. That means uh, we need to create or uh, increase the local capacities in terms to, to, to business management, financial issues too. And then is to create this, as uh, you said, uh, as my last speaker said, uh, how to create confidence and to, to create this uh, bridge between the local organization and, and the, the, the investors. That means uh, it takes time, as uh, we know, to create this confidence and at the same time to, to look out the revenues and to look out the social impacts and environmental impacts. I think uh, I, I would like the idea to launch sustainable landscape approach, but uh, I think uh, a lot of people is talking about investments, a lot of people are looking for funds, but uh, they need to take a, a, a pause What's going on? The local capacities and who is the situation in terms to to cultural issues and in terms to uh, political issues. That means um, we take a time, but we need to rethink uh, the strategy to to attract investors. That is the reason that we prioritize what is the most powerful in terms to organization level, in terms to create more. How to say? Uh, what is the honey for the bees? In this case, it, our bees, our bees are can be uh, flying outside the landscape, but we need to demonstrate that our our honey is, is the better quality. That means, uh, so the guy is looking for to provide training to the local guys, and at the same time to create this criteria, and to go go to looking for in this kind of investors for different issue, palm oil or cocoa or other other issue regarding to to the landscape. Okay, thank you. 
so much. Uh, 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 having talked a lot about issues around the type of investors, there are times it's not about the money. We should also remember there's a landscape that needs to be conserved and maybe the type of investors, which type of investors do we need. I want to go back to Carlos. Carlos, based on the questions that have been posed to the panel members, do you have any comment or any addition? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Nancy. Yes, uh, I want to point out that... Um, uh, we have decided to go for the low-hanging fruits. What does it mean? Uh, I want to address the risk, uh, the risk uh, part. Uh, for the energy, renewable energy based on um, palm oil uh, residues and effluents, this is not new in, in Honduras. If you look at the CDM registry, project registry, there are several that have already been registered or approved and have already uh, um, created these uh, carbon credits. And they have had revenues based on the power generation. So this is not new. And so what we need is just to go uh, one step further and invest on renewable energy to take all this effluence from polluting water. So this is something like is very much ready to go, I would say, because uh, these uh, mills and uh, palm oil uh, producers already know about this. So here the biggest challenge is to, to have the investment the soonest, and we can start right away. For the others, if you can see the plant processing for better cocoa quality and in, uh, improving, improving production of, again, we are not starting from zero. Plantations are already there. The cooperatives already have a capital that they can put as a collateral for the investments and take it from there. So and the same uh, for the investment that is going to be the 2,000, 2000 new hectares of cocoa agroforestry. We have been very careful at selecting industrial partners. This is something very important for all these um, investments uh, at a large scale. You need a very serious industrial partner. What does it mean? We need first to talk to all those that are demanding quality cocoa. If we don't have that, we cannot go further. We have to discuss prices, amounts to be delivered, and programs for delivery. And that's what we have been doing. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about Ritter, but in Nicaragua, Ritter uh, buys cocoa quality cocoa, and they want to have a sourcing of 2,000 tons per year. But they are only sourcing something like 900 to 1,000 at the moment. So we have 1,000 tons to go. If we have Ritter as an as a industrial partner, then we are pretty much on our way to a very good investment. So with very or low in the risk. I wouldn't say no risk, but it would reduce the risk. And this is the approach that we are taking on. Uh, for the renewable energy projects, we cannot invest $1 unless we have a power purchase agreement. If we have that, then we are ready to go. We don't need anything else. Also for the carbon credits. If we have the power purchase agreement, we will know how to estimate uh, how many uh, tons of uh, methane, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we can we can reduce for the atmosphere and take it for the carbon credits. Thank yes, you, thank Carlos. You. Uh, I want to take back my time because Carlos can speak forever. Uh, he's a colleague, I know, <laughs> about his passionate programs. But uh, allow me to open this. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, allow me to open up this to the 
to the to the audience uh this was uh for sharing lessons and uh any questions that we have uh do you have any lessons we can share or any comment about this session or any contribution on how best this can be done just before we go to the question no, it's a question, it's a question. Just ask. <laughs> um yes i mean we heard a lot about the private sector Oh, yes. Uh, okay, my name is Patrick Halland. I'm from DEFCO, uh, United uh, European Commission um, Entity for Development Cooperation. Um, so the question is, um, we heard a lot about the private sector and about uh, financing uh, private uh, interventions. I was wondering how you see the role for the public sector. We haven't discussed this. And that's one question. And the other, the other question is also, if we talk about landscape approaches, we talk about territories, and we talk about territories, we talk about cross-sectoral approaches and about multi-stakeholder processes. And I was wondering how broad these multi-stakeholder processes that have apparently have taken place, uh, did it go beyond only the value chain stakeholders? Did it involve the communities at large and so on? So I'd like to have a bit more information on that, because otherwise, we, of course, we are in the logic of financing um, meaningful enterprises that will take care for the, for the environment and landscapes, but maybe we are not exactly in the landscape approach which is broader than this. This, this is my question. Okay, thank you so much. I would request that, um, uh, Carlos, maybe you talk about the role of the, pla of the public sector, but then Katie, are you able to talk about the landscape multi-stakeholder approach by Solidaridad, how it brings together different actors? I know you've not been a panelist, but I want you to answer that, yeah? Let's start with you on inclusion of the public sector. Well, thank you, Patrick. You have raised a very good question, by the way. Uh, in, in, the, in the three examples that we have shown, the most critical one is the power generation uh, and to be able to have the power purchase agreement. Uh, this requires a very precise policy. Uh, we need the public sector. And uh, by the way, uh, three months ago, when I first heard about this investment, the government in Honduras was not allowing additional renewable energy uh, industries going on, going in into the matrix so but uh, three weeks ago they passed uh, a law that da that now they are allowing a private sector to go into power generation into the grid so this is a very good news because then we can go forward with power purchase agreement <coughs> sorry so for the other, uh, for the other uh, two investments, uh, it's very much, uh, I would say, it's a, a step further to business as usual. So we are not, uh, uh, you know, removing too much into the public sector, just expanding or improving what we already have. But of course, as we go on, uh, we are now uh, talking more with the uh, public entities because now there is an opportunity with the European Union for the Avaflect. You know, Avaflect is a forest-driven uh, value chain that uh, is allowing uh, Honduras to sell wood uh, or timber to, to the European Union. So we have not talked to these actors yet and we want to see how, uh, you know, how the, the government will uh, motivate or provide incentives uh, for forestries or for forest projects and how will this go about because we are very interested how will this affect our landscape approach. So we are very, we have a team in, on the ground uh, looking at, you know, all the decisions that are being made too because like this mining, the mining I was talking about, I, we, how can we stop this? So th these are things that, decisions that are away and that will, of course, will have an impact. On our Just a moment uh, before we go to the landscape multi-stakeholder approach, let's finish on the question of uh, inclusion of the public sector. Let me give it to Duncan first. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think that the public sector would have to play a, a very large role in this project, and I would point to two main um, issues. One is I don't believe that there's a, a commercially oriented investor who would, who would be investing in hundreds of small farmers and giving them uh, a loan or whatever for 10 years. I don't think that's ever going to happen. So you need a public support for a risk guarantee or some kind of public money to make a commercial investor to feel confident to put money into anything like this. And then the second is getting back to what I was saying before about the capacity of the counterparty. So if it's a financial institution or, or whatever it is, that the uh, an investor feels that their counterparty has the capacity to manage their investment, and so you probably need some support from the public, the public sector to build up that that counterparty. Yeah, just I want to add that uh, we present just to the main, uh, how to say, drivers instead to priorities are investment. But let me th th think about the public goods, which is water, for example, which is a municipal level. That means in our strategy to to take an account to listen to several actors in the platform, we had a lot of demands how to protect the watershed and how to protect the water for. For, for, for the towns, for the municipal level. So we decide to, to support, to make more precise study about the demands of water and how to, to treatment that, you know, what are the urban areas and how to provide water for the communities. That means there are uh, communities, uh, uh, um, not junior, but the board uh, organized by themselves. And that means we decided that this is other line, how to create investments for, for municipal level. Uh, trying to or orient the investment too. And the other issue is regarding to, to the, the national reserves. In the same case, in the platform, we listened uh, uh, what's going on, how the private sector can to invest in the natural areas. And we create this dialogue right now, how to, to invest themselves, each other, to support each other this as, as a first level. But at the same time, due to this is a beautiful area, uh, and, and Johan uh, tells us that uh, the potential about sustainable tourism using this coral reef as a very attractive, you know, and the other natural reserves uh, that are uh, there, that means uh, we create uh, other alliances between them and to provide orientation to the public investments. At the same time, we have other proposals instead of investment regarding to sustainable tourism. Thank you so much. Time cannot allow to go too much, but let me give you a chance. Yes. Well, um, I'm working for Oro Verde Foundation um, for the Conservation of Tropical Forests. That's why we are implementing projects together with um, local partners, um, for example, in, in Guatemala. And this is the thing that I would like to add. Um, it's not only important to work together with industrial partners, it's also important um, to, um, to work together with local implementing partners, um, especially when you're working with local communities. You, you need partners um, who have the access to these communities and who are able um, to, uh, to um, because this requ requires a lot of time. It's also a lot of work. You need a lot of a lot of um, resources to, um, to to build these capacities at the local community level, and um, um, to, to to build this organizational strengthening. And um, this is where we also think. Um, is, a, is something where the public um, money um, shall go to, to to support the capacity building and the organizational strengthening on the local rural community level um, to, uh, to, to get the local communities, the smallholder farmers associations um, to that point um, where they may be able to, to also um, uh, implement um, such, such investment projects. Yeah, I'm conscious of the time since we're <laughs> closing. But just in, uh, to get back to that question about aren't we now just talking about value chain um, interventions and investments and how does it do justice to what a landscape approach is? I think uh, Flavio touched on it briefly in the introduction, but what's 
I, what I find fascinating about the work in Honduras, Soledad, as a, as a civil society organi organization, we have been working specifically on commodity sectors in the past, moving them towards more sustainable practice. So in Honduras, the, the, we have been active for over eight years now, and the initial effort was to bring together the palm oil sector, and that happened in a consortium at national level, which has committed itself to RSPO certification, which which means that they are dedicated to to prevent that uh, that expansion from happening on slopes, etc. It comes with a whole. Uh, framework of what you should and should not do. But the point is that because the sector committed to those ambitions, they realized that they had to work together with other actors in the landscape. And that it was sort of a natural shift from how we, we started from a sort of sector oriented approach, placed us in a position that we could broaden that um, stakeholder platform, including Cocoa, including tourism, but also including uh, organizations representing indigenous communities. And uh, Flavio can speak more from personal experiences, but uh, it has apparently enabled actors to come together, which used to be in conflict with each other. And I, one more point I would like to, to add is that I think it's very important to understand when do you open up and take this landscape perspective also in your analysis and when do you then narrow it down again and come with a proposition that speaks to specific actors like you cannot keep it open all the time at a landscape scale because these investments they have to be very specific talking about specific actors doing things differently and needing the money to do it so i think your question is very valid and i wanted to emphasize that our entry point is working in these landscapes where commodity production is dominant and we take this like the modeling is a perfect example how you open up to the understanding the landscape as a whole but to act you also have to make it more specific yeah and i got the red card <laughs> okay uh, our time is up I would like just us to give a round of applause to our facilitators for the day. Allow me to close these discussions. And I would like to say that our booth is right behind here. You can learn about our landscape uh, programs in Honduras, the Chaco area in South America, Brazil, uh, the Ganga Air Basin in Asia, Merapi Volcanoes in Indonesia, in Africa, Tanzania. We are working in the Kilimanjaro and in Zambia, Mazabuka district. So all those give different experiences that we can learn about. Uh, welcome to our boots, but we also have this that you can carry away and tell us what we need and we can always interact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our EBO panel. In Kenya we say asante ni sana. Yes. <laughs>